Today, what we're really going to focus on in this process is the story part, OK? I'm going to get up uh, after I have one of my idols here, Mr. TJ Rowletter, come and share his 25 years worth of experience and over $150 million worth of sales experience in, in the marketplace. I'm going to come up uh, and share a little bit about what I know about storytelling. Then we're going to turn it over to the real storytelling expert this afternoon, Michael Hagen. I'm, today's like Christmas for me, um, you know, this morning and tonight and, and this afternoon. So we've got a lot to cover, and you guys just need to come in to your seats and sit down and really be ready to just engage and, and have some fun. So um, two quick things for me. John talked about the autoresponder madness course in his uh, pr presentation last night. We tried to get Andre Chaperone, who created that course, it's an amazing course, to come and share some of his ideas with us. He couldn't make it, but as a parting gift, he created a link for all of you guys to access the course itself. It's a $300 course. It's actually one of the best courses on, on email marketing that I've personally gone through. Um, and uh, he's, he's made it available to everybody. So here's the link for it. It's going to be live until tonight. You just go and download, consume it. So. Send him a ton of thanks and a ton of emails for this, because that's, that's really awesome of him to do. Um, as I talk about TJ, what I'd like to do here is give you guys a gift. I, I splurge for you guys. If you guys have not had the opportunity to read, well, really all of his stuff, but this, I remember vividly reading on a plane. Um, I think I was on the way to Tampa to learn Speaking Empire Guys stuff, to really learn how to present better. And reading this book just blew my mind in terms of how to create offers and really getting to know your marketplace. Um, and it's made me a ton of money, this little book right here. So I decided to... Uh, asked TJ to bring some for you guys, and I bought you guys a bunch. So if you guys don't have one, um, I'd like to pass them out to you guys, you know? You go. So as I pass this around, let me just talk. Um, it's a great honor to have TJ here to, to share a little bit of his experience with us. I was first introduced to TJ um, through some of the Dan Kennedy Platinum Mastermind recordings way back when I got started. Um, here's how it happened. John Alanis was one of the first guys I, I, I uh, had a consultation day with that really helped me. And his customer service manager was a guy named Randy. Randy Sheaf uh, ran a lot of customer service and still does for a lot of guys in our, in our space. And he had everybody's products. And so when Nixie's like, returns would come in, he'd say, hey, do you want this? So there were some uh, Platinum Mastermind CDs that he gave me, and TJ and Bill and John and all those other guys were in there just talking it up. And uh, it got me excited about the idea of masterminds. But this guy was doing exactly what I wanted to do in my marketplace. And it gave me uh, a level to aspire to. And so for years, I've been quietly kind of studying his stuff and just really admiring his work and uh, just loving everything that he does. And uh, it, it's just an honor last year to actually get the chance to meet him and have some conversations on the phone. And uh, uh, when I asked him to, to come and share a few of his experiences with you guys, I was you know, hopefully optimistic, but I know he doesn't get out of uh, Kansas much. And so when he said yes, I was like, oh, this is insane. This is going to be an event that's going to be like nothing else. I got excited. Like I said, it's like Christmas for me. So like everyone else here, I, I'm probably more excited than you guys are for him to come and share. You're going to see me with my notebook just like feverishly taking notes. I don't know what he's going to share. I know he's going to share a ton of value in terms of what he does in his business. But one thing I asked him to talk about as it relates to the invisible funnel is right here. His business, unlike my business, is offline, direct mail, you know, chopping down tons of trees and sending lots and lots of... <laughs> stuff to people in the mail. And there's a huge opportunity that I haven't tested yet that I'm excited to test 
right here at the point of the webinar, if you like this, you know, you can pay. If not, it doesn't matter. But we get all their information, right? We get their credit card information, their full address, and all that. Well, why not send them that CD and a direct mail package as a follow-up sequence for this big ticket, right? And that's his game. So I'm excited to hear him share a little bit about that. And I know that that stuff will take this whole process to the next level. So TJ, man, I'm excited to have you here. He's been up since 3.15. <laughs> excited to share. All right. Well, thank you, Dagan. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Russell, thanks, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really do. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been thinking about this for the last couple months. Uh, so Dagan asked me to share everything I've learned in 25 years about how to create offers that generate millions of dollars. And I didn't take that lightly. I really wanted to deliver for you guys. And so I've been thinking about all of this. And uh, it's caused a lot of confusion and frustration for me. And how do, I, how do I condense it all for you? What can I say that will really make an impact? Uh, that's my sincerest desire for all of you guys, that something that I say in the next hour or so, or whenever, whenever you tell me that we've run out of time or whatever. Um, well, I do three-day seminars, Dagan. I do three-day seminars all the time. So uh, um, it's actually harder for me to cram stuff into just a little bit of space than to do a big, big, long thing. But um, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this, you know. And, and you guys are already really razor-sharp marketers, so you already know a lot of things. And, what can I say to people that have already studied marketing and, and already know a lot? Um, yeah, you want me to talk about direct mail? I'll just say this. When I was part of Dan Kennedy's mastermind group with Mr. Bill Glazier and John Olinus and, uh, and other really sharp marketers, we had two internet marketing experts that were part of our group. And um, my wife Eileen and I, uh, they used to laugh at us. They, they would laugh at us because, you know, we're from Kansas and People kind of laugh at people from Kansas anyway. You know, I mean, uh, they think that everybody in Kansas is married to their first cousins. Or, um, and uh, Kansas is the place where they all fly over, you know. At one point, they've, uh, everybody's flown over it. But um, so they, they all were, uh, they had those, they, those images of a person from Kansas already in their heads. And then they knew that we mailed a lot of direct mail. And they just, they just thought, this was when the internet was first taken off like a rocket ship. Uh, late 1990s, and uh, they, they thought that uh, direct mail was like old-fashioned. And, uh, and nowadays, a lot of internet marketers are starting to get attracted about, you know, thinking about direct mail. They're starting to see that it really, um, yes, it is old-fashioned, but there's so many cool, high-tech, innovative things you can do with direct mail uh, that you were never able to do 25 years ago when we first started in it. And it's only limited by your imagination, um, which for some people that's a problem. Because, you know, they think that direct mail is just like mailing postcards or something like that. They can't get beyond, uh, you know, they're trying to do what P.T. Barnum used to call, and this is back to like 1800s when he said this. He said most people are trying to catch a whale by using a minnow as bait. And when it comes to direct mail, I see that everywhere, where people think direct mail is just mailing postcards. Now, postcards have a place in, in direct mail, no question about it. When it comes to all of the follow-up and stuff, it, it should be part of a, of a long uh, sequence. Uh, you can save some money, and you can do all kinds of sizes of postcards and that kind of thing. But, but primarily, the thing about direct mail that it has over internet marketing or some internet marketing is it can be very, um, what I call, disruptive. And I, I'd like for everybody just to think about that word, disruptive. That's a good direct mail campaign is. It's, it's the next best thing to a salesperson just kind of getting in your face. I mean, if, if you think about what salesmanship is, a direct mail is like a sales, it's, it's like taking all of the elements of a good salesperson and cramming it into an envelope. And, um, the best direct mail letters, they're, they, they are, they're disruptive. Uh, the best offers are disruptive, too. They also, they won't let you go. They, uh, they get you excited. So, um, you know, I, I'm glad that you have a place in your invisible funnel system for it. 
I would say this. One of the biggest handicaps that people have when it comes to direct mail marketing is they only focus on the cost of it. And they can never wrap their mind. They know it's expensive. And they know that internet marketing is dirt cheap. You know, you can do all kinds of internet marketing for nothing. And so people love stuff that they can do for free, and they hate stuff that costs money. And, and yet, the only thing that really matters is how much you spend versus how much you make. And through testing, if you want to do it right, through testing, you can prove to yourself, and you should, that the money that you spend on direct mail is, uh, is it, the, it makes you more money. So you're spending more money, but you're doing a more effective job of selling, and therefore you're able to make more money. And that's, that's the, I'm glad you got a place in the invisible funnel system for that. So um, that's, is that, is that enough for direct mail? I mean, look, direct mail is exciting. I, I, I know it's old fashioned, but there's so many cool things you can do with personalization, with um, um, lumpy mail, and it's, it's, a, it's really a creative kind of thing. Uh, I sent Dagan a box of my direct mail. Yeah, yeah, I sent, I sent him some of my direct mail that we've done. And, you know, you can, you can do um, cool little booklet mailers, which really work great for us. It's, um, yeah, you're spending more money, and it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass to print them up in large quantities and stuff like that. You have to work with a really good printer. Uh, uh, but, you know, just lots of colorful kinds of things, just things that sort of force involvement. Uh, a chance to do personalization, uh, some of the printing technology that's happening nowadays. Um, you know, I... Uh, I promised Russell last night I was going to send him a great big box of my direct mail, and he told me that at one time he was saving junk mail, and then it, and then it got thrown away by accident or something like that, and he, he talked about how much he missed it, and I, I'm going to send him a big old box of it so he can just <laughs> spread it all on the floor, roll around with it, play around with it. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, some people call this stuff junk mail, but not, not those of us that are in the business. There's just... To us, this is just a, it's a, just a real creative kind of way to do lots of really cool things. And, uh, and I would just encourage all of you to get on some good mailing lists. You know, um, I spend money buying stuff that I don't even want, I have no desire for, in marketplaces that, are, that don't really, I, I just want to get on the mailing list. And uh, so that I can get more junk mail. So, I, you know, um, and, um, I have one question. All right. So, I literally, I went through everything, I studied and highlighted everything. Um, me as an online guy, when I see the envelope and the, and the little tear sheet to send in, I always think to myself, you know, why not just have a phone number and have them go to a website? Does it, is there like a significant amount, of, are there a significant amount of people that always respond by sending? Oh, yeah. Different people respond different ways. And it's, um, and different marketplaces. Uh, so, in, you know, it, 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 there's, there's no, the best thing that you can probably do, and I think, Bill, you'd back this up, is the, um, having many different ways for people to respond, including a website or, or something online, is probably the smartest thing. And um, I think that as long as the strategy is correct and you do a few things right, then it's always going to be, uh, you're going to make more money by having that in part of your sequence. And, and um, you know, the, the, the challenge, or one of the challenges of Dagan asking me a few months ago if I would speak on, on creating offers, is that a, a lot of times everybody just wants the magic, they just want the magic pill. You know, just give me, uh, give me the formula, I'll, and I'll write it all, and I'll just duplicate the formula, and that's going to, you know, make me all this money. But it's not that simple. It's not that easy. Um, because, like, you can have the greatest offer ever. And I'll, I'll tell you some things that I believe that that would incorporate uh, throughout in my presentation. But you can have the greatest offer ever, but if it's going to the wrong person, they're not going to respond. And on the flip side, you can have an offer that's just uh, a really terrible offer. And if it's going to the right person, you can make excellent money. So who is the right person? Hopefully, it's somebody that's on your mailing list or your email list. It's somebody you're doing business with right now. 
That is, that's, you know, somebody who's already bought from you, they like you, they trust you, they respect you. There's a, when people spend money, there's, that's what they're saying to you. I mean, they're not, they, they, very seldom will they come up to you and say, I like you, I trust you, I respect you. But when, when they spend money with you, that's really what they're saying. Here's something I thought I'd tell you guys this morning. I, 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 as many notes as I wrote down this morning, I wrote something down because I want to give you guys uh, something you've never heard before. That's my goal. After being here yesterday and listening to all you sharp guys, uh, now this is going to sound, it's, it's not politically correct, and I'm sure it's not right in every detail either. All right? But here it is. Never underestimate the greed of your customers. Because when it comes to spending money, even the nicest people, even the nicest people often turn into animals. I, I wrote that this morning, and, and I want you guys to think about it, because you can have people that are really great, in, 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 the, 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 the nicest people in the world, when it comes to spending money, I really believe, and there's probably plenty of exceptions to this, but as a general rule, when it comes to spending money, people are pretty damn greedy. All they're thinking about is themselves. They're not thinking about anybody but them and, and getting those immediate benefits that they want the very most. And, um, you know, greed and fear, that's what drives my marketplace. Those two emotions right there. Sure, there's other emotions come into play, and I, I like uh, what Russell was saying yesterday about, you know, certainty and variety and, and, all, and meeting all five or six of those needs. But um, if you can just play with greed and fear, just, just stick with those two, um, you're, you're in good shape. And look, I brought one prop with me. That's it. This is just, this is it. Didn't have room for more. I would have brought more props. But this was the little thing that started my wife and I 25 years ago. It's a, it's a little pamphlet that we were selling for $12.95 back in the late 80s and uh, called Dialing for Dollars. It was a little money-making program that Eileen and I created. Uh, we, it's a combination of some programs that we bought, we tested them, and then we made money with them and we wrote a booklet about it. We had no idea that the marketplace was millions of people and, and that we'd still be doing it 25 years later, that we'd still be involved in this marketplace. Um, and I like, I like, I've got many copies of this little booklet around my house just as a, as a visual reminder of, uh, you know, it, all it takes is just a small spark. And once you're in, involved in a marketplace and you've got a customer base, they'll just keep rebuying stuff from you again and again and again. I've got a, a, a bookkeeper, a bookkeeper slash accountant. He started working for our company after we were like a little over a year old back when we just had this little tiny booklet and business was good we were making we were by that time we were making pretty good money uh, but he knew our product this was our product that we had and he's a smart guy uh, he's like a men's member they tell me your IQ has to be like I don't know it has to be pretty high to get to get in that that group and and um, he just said man there's no way this company's ever gonna make it I got to get my resume out there and uh, because they're going to they're going to go under there's this is not this is not a long term kind of deal. And but then we kept him busy. And uh, and then about six months later, he said, man, I got to go find I got to get my resume out there. This thing's not going to last. Uh, bottom line is he's still with us today. <laughs> you know, after all of these years, it's just proof that the market comes first. The market is more important than anything else. Um, when, when we first started selling this little booklet and we were, we, we were making more money than we ever made in our lives, um, I, I went to my dad's house. His wife was there. And um, she's got a master's degree. She's a really intelligent person. And uh, she took one look at this little booklet. She flipped through it. She saw that it was just poorly written. It's filled with typographical errors. I mean, it, I, I was a lousy writer then, and I'm not that much better now. And, and she said, how much are you selling this thing for? And, and we told her, you know, $12.95. And she saw that it was just like a little pamphlet, you know. And, and she just threw it across the room. <laughs> and she said, this is shit. Just like that. <laughs> and, uh, and I just wanted to, like, grab her out of the chair. And, boom! <laughs> uh, 
you know, but I didn't, I didn't. I, did, I didn't talk to her for about three years. Um, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but, you know, now I can honestly see now, now that, I'm, now that I'm 25 years older and a little smarter, I could see what she was, where she was coming from. I could see where, you know, she didn't understand our market at all. She didn't know anything about all of these people that buy business opportunities and, and the kind of stuff that they were buying because compared to what they were buying, this was a damn good program compared to a lot of the other programs that they were buying. And we had people that were making thousands of dollars a month with this little tiny program. We had one guy that was doing a couple million a year or five million a year eventually um, with, with um, a version of this same little program. We kept making it better. We kept adding stuff to it. And eventually we sold it for $30. We had all these other manuals that went with it. But, you know, it's, it's, the marketplace is just more important than anything else. So you asked me to speak about offers. There is absolutely, positively nothing more important than, than the people that you're selling to. The list is king. It will always be king. It'll always be the most important thing. Um, and you focus on that list and you keep, you know, the, the, the one thing that I see is that, and I didn't realize this either. It took me years to figure this out. And I had some great help from some great people that helped me figure this out. And I'm, I thank God for that. But it's coming up with new stuff constantly. You know, that's a not, there's a, a, most people just aren't selling enough, reselling enough stuff to their existing customers. And I had help uh, uh, back when Eileen and I first got started. We had a guy that, uh, his name is Russ Von Holscher. He's a great man. Um, he had been in the business about 20 years. He used to come to our home and work with us over the weekend. And um, we were just brand new, little babies in the business. And um, all we would do is just sit around our kitchen table drinking a lot of coffee and eating a lot of good food and just talking about things that our customers would get excited about. That was it. What could we sell them that they would get excited about? And we'd toss around different ideas. And all of a sudden, Russ, we had big old stack of legal pads. Uh, he's a copywriter. And he would just go crazy, uh, just, just writing furiously. Uh, we'd have him all cranked out on coffee and stuff and, um, and uh, kept, kept the cup full, you know, and kept feeding him sugar products and stuff. And, uh, and, um, and he would just go crazy. He would just, he would just be consumed, uh, um, you know, frantically just writing, ripping sheets around and stuff like that. And, uh, and Eileen and I were just sitting back and, and to me it was like, I didn't have to witness that too much before something inside of me said, man, I think I can do that. Because I'm kind of a little bit like that too. I kind of get crazy sometimes too and I, I get caught up in stuff and I get excited real easily. And, and, and then we would take, Russ would go home, we'd uh, put him on an airplane on Sunday uh, after, late afternoon. He'd fly back to California. We'd take that big old stack of legal pads, take them over to our lady that did the typing and uh, then we'd just reformat them a little bit. We'd stuff it into letter, you know, envelopes, throw it out to our customers. Within just a couple of weeks, what, what he scribbled on all of those pages, some of it kind of illegible, you know, hard to read. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we'd have to, he'd tear paper and we'd have to put tape on it and stuff. But um, it was just to, to witness that kind of thing. From the birth of an idea to a bunch of, you know, just scribbled kind of pages to a, an offer that went out to our customers and then comes back with the money. I mean, it just, I, that's when I really, truly, truly fell in love with the business. Um, that's when I made the decision that I was going to do this for the rest of my life, that I had sort of found my calling, if you will. Um, and, then, and then, of course, it took me about eight years of working very, very, very hard and um, being somewhat humiliated or humbled um, before I was good enough where I could consistently create offers to people that outside of the customer base. You know, people that had no relationship with us before, 
Um, and um, new customer acquisition is what we call it. And uh, eight years of trial and error and getting, you know, where we would mail offers out to our customers that would work. We'd make, you know, three, four times ad cost or more. Um, but then you throw it out there to people that have never done business with you and uh, losing money, losing money, losing money for eight years. Uh, being dependent on other copywriters like Russ and a few other copywriters during that eight year period um, who were good enough and had the talent and the skill. And I guess the moral of that story is, you know, again, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with your own customers, you don't have to, you, your level of skill doesn't have to be nearly as much. It, it should inspire all newcomers greatly that um, people who give you money and do business with you, that relationship is the most important thing. You guys already know that. I know, I know you do. Um, um, another big part, of, a, a big, big part of the offer, and again, you guys, uh, right here. It's, it's the story. I think, you, I think that everybody can benefit from spending a lot of time thinking about your story. What is your story in relation to, how, uh, to customers? Because that's all they care. Again, we're spending money. People are, even the nicest people can be very extremely greedy and self-centered. Yes? When, when you do direct mail, when do you start the story? Like, is it like as soon as they start reading, they get into your story? Man, there's no easy answer to that. Yeah. I, I think it depends, it depends on the offer. It depends on the offer and the format. And, and, and a big part of offers, see, I think the offer is three pieces to an offer. This is just me trying to keep it simple, all right? It's, uh, or three parts of success here is, and uh, is simply, it's the right offer to the right person with the right strategy. So the, the answer to that question, Roger, would depend on the, the strategy that's involved. Uh, we do a lot of teleseminars, and on every teleseminar within the first 10 minutes, I'm telling my story again. And I've been doing this now for 25 years. I'm so sick of my story. I am sick of it. I, got, I started getting sick of it about 12 years ago. Uh, so for the last, you know, the, the, the first 12 years, it was all right. I, my, I had, I, I, my ego was, a, was bigger back then than now. And it's just the older I get. And I'm thinking to myself, am I going to be 60 years old? Am I going to be 70 years old? Still telling my same freaking story. Year after year after year, day after day, every time we do a pitch. Pardon me? <laughs> well, yeah, you, there, there can be new twists, and there have been. There have been, and, there, and, 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 and the story's had to change a little bit, but it's the same. It's, for me, it's the same basic. It's the only thing my customers care about, which is this. It's the same thing your customers care about. What do you have that they can bond with? What is it about your story? And some of it you might have to fabricate a little bit. I'm, I'm not saying to lie to people. You know, you take that element of truth and try to play with it a little bit. Um, I'm not saying to lie to anybody, but what is it in your story that, that could be something that would be really, really, really important to them? My story is simple. And it's a story that has generated many, many millions of dollars. And it's a real simple story. It's the whole before and after story. You know, here's where we were before. Uh, and it's a true story, by the way. We were, we were uh, mostly me, it wasn't my wife. But um, it was me spending every single penny that I had on all these get rich quick programs. I was dead broke, um, could barely afford to keep a roof over my head, uh, miserable, hated my job, hated my life, was totally frustrated. And yet, I, 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 my name was on all of these mailing lists, and I was sending away for program after program after program. And all my friends and family told me I was a moron, an idiot to think that I could ever make millions of dollars. And yet, I kept spending all my money on these various programs. And then, because I didn't give up and I didn't listen to the naysayers of my life, then we, get, we hooked up with the right program, and we made millions of dollars within a few short years. There's my story. That's my story, although I just gave you the fast version, but that's my story. You, you guys need a story that, that, that bonds you with your customers. The more dramatic it is, and the more that your story is their story, and the more that you are the after in, the, in their before kind of thing. Uh, so think about things like that. That one, don't lie. Don't, I'm not asking anybody to lie, but, uh, but 
but the story has to the story is an important part of your offer. Yeah, and, 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 and after you do it year after year after year after year, it just, oh man, but it's still, it's, we, we, we have done, we have done uh, presentations where we didn't put the story in there, and you can see the numbers really clearly. You can see presentations with the story versus without, so every time we do a little script for any one of our sales presentations, it's always got the story right up there in front, right after the promise. I mean, you know, the first, first, the, I, I've, I've got a little formula that I brought with me, but I'm, I'm not, I, you've got all of that with all of this, so I, I don't necessarily want to talk about the little formula. And, um, but but, but the, first, the first part is worth mentioning, and that's, that's the, the big promises. It all starts, every great offer starts with a huge promise. We want to hear, we want to hear your formula. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. It's the, it's, it's the, it's, it's the boring part. All right, here it is. Here's my, eight, here's my formula. Here it is. Eight, there's only eight things. It's all stuff you've heard before. And, and I don't, I, I, unlike some of other people, to me the formula isn't, made, it's not in concrete or anything like that. It's just a thought. Think of this as just thought joggers. When you're, when you're getting ready to pitch to your, just like, when you're getting ready to pitch to your, your people, it's nice just to have some, uh, some guidelines. That's all I see these eight things as. Sometimes you don't need all eight. Sometimes you'll just, you'll just need four of the eight. But the first one you absolutely need, and that is, I believe you need it absolutely, uh, is that two or three great big promises that are just going to blow them away. And what is that? I don't know. I know what it is in my market. I know, what, I know and each offer is different. But two or three promises that are like even over the top a little bit. You know, they're just, they're big and they're bold and they're right up front. You know, kind of like slapping people in the face. I like what John Allen has said yesterday about just the kind of problems that we have to deal with these days where people are so, well, what did John say? They have nine seconds worth of, uh, you know, I mean, it's, people are harder to get to, they're harder to reach. It's harder to sell people, and that shouldn't be a negative thing at all. It just should be a challenge for all of us. And it's also, it thins out, you know, just thins out the market a little bit and makes some, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, 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 um, I don't look at it as a bad thing. I look at it as, a, as something that is a problem that has to be overcome. So two or three great big monstrous promises. That's what we always try to focus on. The second step is to um, try to, uh, I call it establishing maximum credibility. You know, why they should listen to you. Why should they listen to you? You're making them a big, huge promise in the beginning. People like big promises, by the way. It's like a big headline of a sales letter or, or the, the, the copy as they go to a website or whatever. I mean, it's the, somebody, somebody said, like, um, supposedly, like in the 17th century, that a big promise is the soul of an advertisement. And I think that even though that's a few hundred years ago somebody said that, I think it's still true today. So the promise will kind of wake them up a little bit, but then you try to, why should they listen to you? And, and then the third thing is just to try to overload them with more information than they can handle. And does that sound familiar to you? Is, is that part of your invisible funnel system? Uh, 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 to cause a little pain and agitation, you know, Tell them the what and the why, but not the how. So you kind of make it a little complicated, you know, but, but first you're starting with the promise, then you're telling them why they should listen to you, then you're kind of overloading them with some information, it, and that could be just five, ten minutes. It doesn't, it doesn't have to go on and on forever. It depends on, on the offer. And, and then the fourth thing is use stories and examples to back up everything you told them on the third thing. Um, it's to help people see the truth in what you've been telling them. You know, people nowadays are more skeptical than they've ever been. John was talking about that yesterday. They, they simply don't believe anything anymore. They might, they might pretend like they, they do, but in, in the back of all of us, every one of us in this room, I know, I'm, I'm looking at you guys right now, behind those eyeballs that I'm looking at, there's doubt, skepticism, you're somewhat jaded in some ways, or cynical, 
That's just the world that we live in. So the, so the, the fourth step in, in my little guidelines is uh, you come up with a, with, a, with a story that just helps people see the, uh, see the truth or a metaphor, example, to help make, make things, to, it's more of an emotional thing then. And then the fifth one is to start selling your ultimate solution. Make it clear which, um, you know, what, uh, what you're telling them to do and how you can help them. So you're, you're starting to pitch your solution. The sixth step, uh, so the fifth step is to sell your ultimate solution. The sixth step is to build value of the ultimate uh, solution. I, I heard Russell talk about that yesterday. People, people only know about something by something else that they compare it to. Uh, if they don't have something else that they can compare it to, they're never going to see the value in it. So you're educating them on how, how much money they could spend or how much, in order to get those benefits that you promised them in step number one, all the bullshit that they might have to go through in order to, um, um, Dagan told me I could say bullshit and I could, uh, you know, I can't do that with my customers. My customers, I can't talk like that. Yeah. EJ, isn't that backwards? Normally, don't you build the value first? You could. These are just guidelines. These are, these are not, 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 nothing in concrete here. Um, thought joggers. I just think, I see these as thought joggers. Um, and then the seventh step is um, that irresistible offer. And try to, you know, somebody that's smarter than me once said, and, it, and, it's, and, it, and I knew, I've known this now for about 12 years, it's a really great question if you've never heard it before. Here it is. If I had godlike superpowers, and if I could offer my customers anything that they desired, and I, and I just had those godlike superpowers, what would I offer them? And, I, and as soon as somebody told me that about 12 years ago or 13 years ago, I wrote it down, I thought about it, and I've, I've been, you know, that's, that's the kind of mentality that you need when you're creating these offers is, is uh, then, then of course you may have to scale back because none of us do have those godlike superpowers, you know, but, uh, but, um, uh, but the irresistible offer is something so compelling that people just won't be able to say no. And then the eighth one is what is the strongest and most compelling reason why they must take action right now, today? You've got to make it real, and you've got to build that sense of urgency in your pitch. And the best example I can give you for that eighth step is something that we're doing next Tuesday. It's uh, not my idea. Uh, my marketing guy came up with this idea, but it's pretty brilliant, I think, and I, I thought I'd share it with you guys. We're doing a teleseminar next Tuesday. We've been promoting it. And um, we're telling them at this event, if they, if, while they are at this teleseminar, it's going to last about 80 minutes, that they can actually make money while they're at this event. Probably something you got. I mean, we just came, it's a brand new idea for us. Russell's probably been pitching that for years, for all I know. But it's, to us, it's brand new. It's a brand, we've never done that before. And I, I think. That is like an eighth step to us, creating that great sense of urgency. And, and now if they listen to the teleseminar and they don't take action, then of course they're not going to be able to make money. So it's, uh, and it's really simple. The, the hook behind it is really the, what we're, it's a, it's a special ad co-op that we already, we placed the ads yesterday. The ads are going to hit um, um, right during the time that they're running, that we're running the teleseminar. And if they go ahead and buy, it's probably something you've done, right? You've done something similar, right? You're going to. <laughs> I think it's a cool offer. I think you guys should test it. I, I think it's a cool offer. Look, I, I think that um, um, one, one, you guys are probably doing this right now, but just constantly, constantly looking for something new. Or, and there really, there is nothing new under the sun. We know that. There's a Bible verse uh, in the Old Testament that says there's nothing new under the sun. But, but it's, 
but it's, uh, it's making, it's the appearance of something new. People these days, more than ever before, I'm convinced that not only do they have a short attention span, but they also, they're addicted to new stuff. And, and I don't use that word addicted lightly either. I think that my best customers, and maybe your best customers, um, if, I, if I had to describe them in one word, it would be addicts. They are addicted. They almost can't control themselves. That's why, when you think of an addict, you know, there's somebody that they're, 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 they're possessed by something that's bigger than they are. And that's my very best customers. They are, they are totally addicted. Yeah. He said, man, sometimes I think it's like these it's like they have to hurt, like they have herpes. Like sometimes it'll go away. It yeah, yeah, away. well <laughs> Yeah, they 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 say that uh, one out of four or five people have herpes, so um, that means how many people do we have in this room? Uh, <laughs> but uh it's one of those viruses that it, it it goes in and out of remission, but it's always there. Once you've got it. You've got it forever. Um, and that's the way a lot of our, and maybe it's a bad metaphor. I'll be the first to admit it's not. Uh, and look, I don't mean to be disrespectful for my customers. I love my customers. I need more of them. In fact, in fact when I do seminars and I meet uh, my best customers face to face, I'm always saying, if I had $1,000 for every time I've said one of my best customers, you know, where can I find another 10,000 just like you? And they, they see it as a great compliment, which is what I mean it is to be a great compliment, but I also, I'm serious. Where can I find another 10,000 just like them? Um, and, and, uh, and of course, I know the answer to that question too. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work to find people that end up trusting you enough, believing in you enough, uh, where they will continue to keep coming back and giving you their business again and again and again. And so I don't take any of that lightly. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to my customers, but they are addicts, nonetheless. They, they are. They can't control themselves. And you have people within, within your marketplaces that are exactly like that, too. Um, keep coming up with new stuff. Keep looking for new stuff. Whatever's current creates currency. And, and there's always something new. That's the good news. There's always something new. Now, it's not really new. It's the, what I call the veneer of newness. You know, it's sort of like that, um, that plywood that you can just put your hand through. You can punch a hole through it. You know, it looks like real wood. Um, it's the veneer of newness. Um, in fact, when you have something that's working really great for you, this is one of the things that I, one of the main things I wanted to share with you guys is that we, and, and in some ways I don't, I don't like this, it depends on how you look at it. You know the whole, is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? I have two offers right now. I wish I had more. I wish I could stand before you and say I have five offers. But I have two offers right now that are pretty much foolproof. In the sense that they just always work. I wish I had more. Sometimes I, you know, I get, I say, God, we should have more than two offers that just constantly work for us. And in other ways, I'm grateful to have two offers. So, Better than having one offer that, you know, better than having no offer. I have two offers that have just consistently performed for us year after year after year. We keep tweaking them. We keep trying to make them better. We keep adding new stuff to them. But it's the same basic machine of the offer. And so um, I'll tell you, and it's really simple too. I'm going to keep it. Everything I have to share is pretty simple unless I don't communicate it right. The, f the first offer, I call it the chip off the block offer because uh, what we do is, um, and it doesn't matter, I don't want to go into real, bore you with the details of the offer, but basically we give them something that is really valuable. Um, in this case, it's a group of websites that we give them for almost no money, just $9 just as a way of qualifying them. So we ask for nine bucks as a little setup fee or administrative fee. We give them something really valuable, though, for nine bucks. Kind of shock the crap out of them a little bit. You know, wake them up. Get them excited. And then we come along, after we've already given it to them, given them a great deal, we come along and offer them 
a bigger, much bigger block of the same thing that they bought already. And it's just, it's just probably something that's been around forever and ever. It's probably something you guys have already heard about. Or, but in my market, even though we've been doing this now for about 15 or 16 years now, we've been running the same basic, we call it a beta tester offer where we have a group of websites and we tell people that we need beta testers and it's true we do need beta testers they're brand new and as as we know technology always has bugs in it and stuff like that um, has anybody ever here seen our beta tester offer anybody at all in this room uh, we've mailed it we've mailed millions of pieces of this to our that means you guys aren't on on our uh, opportunity uh, junkie mailing list we're give, we give away a, a block of them for free, and then we just ask for a little bit of money. And, um, and then we come along and we offer them a, a bigger group of the same websites that they bought, same variety of websites, and it's just that whole where the, front, the, the first part is, is, is mirrored, is matches the second part. Um, it's called a beta tester offer because it's, look, look, here's the thing, it's a big promise. We're offering people a lot of value for a little bit of money, and people like that, but also makes them skeptical as hell. So that's the, prom that's the problem. When you, you need a big promise to wake people up, to really get their attention, to get them excited. But, but then the skepticism is always there, or the cynical nature of people, or whatever. So they're always, they're always saying, if the, unless, unless they really believe what you have is real, then you're never you're always going to lose money. So we we tell people in our uh, we need beta beta testers. We're looking for a small group of beta testers, and then we give them a small group of sites, and then we come along and we say we've got a much bigger group that also need to be beta tested, and then we make them a special offer on that, which can change. Sometimes they have to buy advertising from us. Um, sometimes we've actually sold them the additional websites, or we offer them other things. Did you have a question? Yeah, is, is your, your bigger chunk follow-up, is that immediately after they say yes right. to the smaller chunk? Right, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. and, then, and then we have uh, a huge sequence that goes out. That, that is something that Bill and I were talking about um, a little bit ago. That's, when, when Eileen and I first started, we had no follow-up at all. Um, and it's amazing that we lasted. It's amazing that we, 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 we got through all of that uh, because, um, and, 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 I've, and over the years, I've seen other people that just, uh, they just, they'll, they'll send out a few, a few direct mail pieces as a sequence or they send out some emails on an autoresponder or whatever, but most people are not doing a good enough job with follow-up. And, and it's, an, it's an area where they're losing a lot of money that could and should be there. Uh, by not aggressively following up with the leads. And you have, to, you have to watch your numbers, you have to test it, you have to be careful because I've, I, I have, I've gone overboard many times where I've spent more money chasing after leads than I should have. Most people, are, they have the opposite problem. They don't spend enough money. And they're trying to do what, remember what P.T. Barnum said, they're trying to catch a, they're trying to catch a whale or they're trying to get a big result. They're trying to get a huge result by doing a small amount of effort or a small amount of money or whatever when they could be, through smart testing, they could be learning how to spend more money in order to make more money. They think that they're being smart, but through testing you can prove to yourself. You don't, you don't, it doesn't have to be something that you just blindly take as faith or whatever. You can, you can prove to yourself um, that, that that money is, an, is really an investment. It's going to make you more money. So, How much should you I'm sorry? How much should you spend? That the, answer, the, an, the answer only comes through testing. The answer to that question and a lot of other questions, Sue, the, the only by testing. Sometimes, sometimes it's like this. Only by going too far do you know you've gone too far. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, so, so what is a perfect offer then? What is a perfect offer? It, premium pricing has to be there. You have, the margins have to be great. You can't spend a lot of money following up if, you don't, if the margins just aren't, aren't there. Um, it has to be something that's just for them, so you have to really put a lot of thought into that. Um, I've got a, a list of a few other things here. Can you, can you give um, an example of what you mean by just for them? 
Well, yeah, yeah, I can. In fact, in fact, I've got the 33 most important words. 33 most important words are these. Um, you don't have to write it down. Just, just get the gist of what I'm saying. Just the gist of it. You guys can write it down in probably five words, but it's, here it is. It's, I'll, give, I'll give you the 33 words that if, if you want them. You can grab my notes here. But it's, um, but it's common sense. You guys will hear it's common sense. It's to know your prospects and customers in the most intimate way. What they are searching for the most and how to create exciting offers that will give it to them in the most compelling way. So it's really understanding these people. Hey, it's understanding them better than they understand themselves. And, and by that I mean this. People buy unconsciously. They don't even know why the hell they buy. They don't know why they're addicts. If you really think about who an addict is, if you guys have ever known anybody that's, that's got an addiction problem, um, think about it. Think about not, drugs and sex and gambling and all the things that people are addicted to. I mean, these are some crazy people. They're doing all kinds of, in, they're insane. They need help. They can't tell you why they can't, you know, why they have to, they're trolling the porn sites all day long or whatever they're doing. They can't, they can't tell you why they're, why they're totally addicted. They, they're, it's beyond their, their, it's up to you to figure out where, where their obsessions are and stuff like that. It's up to you to understand that. And related to that idea is this. Here it is. Buyers are liars. If, um, if you've never heard it before, think about it. It's, it's not a judgment call. It's an observation. They're good people. It's not a judgment call on them. But in our market, we have plenty of customers that lie to us every single day. They lie to us every day. And here's, here's how they lie to us. Your customers are lying to you in different ways, too. Um, in, I sell business opportunities. And in the business opportunity market that I, I'm a part of, the, the segment of that market that I, that I, these are people that what their secret desires really are, they want to get rich. They want to make millions of dollars, and they want it now. That's, their, that's what they want, and I know this for a fact. After being in the market for a long time now, that's their secret desire. It's just to, it's millions and millions of dollars are just going to come pouring in. And they want it, and they want it now, baby. You know, they want it right now. They're looking for that secret. Yeah, we can't promise them that. That's illegal. I would have been in prison a long time ago <laughs> if, if I ever promised them that. Um, and, and, but you have to get, you have to, well, you can't promise them that. You can't promise them any specific sum of money. You have to disclaim the hell out of all your promises. But, um, but, but we have, they lie to us all the time because they say, they say to us all the time, oh, I'd just be happy if I just made an extra $500 or $2,000 a month. We hear that every single day when I know for a fact that it is a lie. And your customers, your buyers are lying to you too. They really are. And so, now I'm not saying all of them are. But if you really look at the, the emotional factors that cause people to, to become habitual rebuyers, and you think about the metaphor of an addict, somebody that's out of control, that really is something beyond their control, um, and they're spending all kinds of money and they're buying it for all these emotional reasons that they can't even explain, then it. Here, you kind of, it's sort of like um, trying to figure out the dark side of your market. That's just what I call it, the dark side of your market. And with every, really, with, a, with every rabid marketplace, there is a dark side. And that dark side, some of what I'm explaining to you now is just the, more of the dark side of the market. I mean, I wouldn't, I'd have to be real careful to say some of these things to my own customers. I have to, be, I have to say it different, much differently than I'm saying it to you. Um, but... There is a dark side to every market. There's a, there's a reason why most of the, the, the people buy. And there, is, there are things that they want that they're not telling you about. And it's up to you to figure those things out. And, and one of the, how do you do it then? How do you do it? Well, first, you think about them all the time. Constantly think about them. You watch what they buy and not watch what they say. You know, you follow the money and don't, don't listen to what they say. Just watch what they do. Um, yeah. Oh, the second offer. I told, you about, I told you about our beta tester offer, all right? Uh, the second one is what we call our uh, advertising and management service. 
it, um, you see, okay, look, think about where you guys were from like 1988 for the decade after that, all right? What, what I was doing was I was, I was pitching to the biz op market, and back, back, in, back in those early days, we could sell a lot of things that we just can't sell now. Uh, we go back and look at all these old offers that we did in the 90s and stuff, and there's no way we can run them now. The market has changed. So starting in the, in the mid-2000s, we started creating these um, done-for-you kinds of services. It used to be all of our, all of our offers in the past were where the customers had to do just a little bit, and then we did a whole bunch of stuff for them. Every offer was like that. You do a little, we do a lot. Starting in the mid-2000s, you don't even have to do a little. And that's our other offer. It's called, it's called the Advertising and Management Service. You give us your money, we do all the advertising and marketing for you, and that's, that's been working like a charm for us. It's, now we can't run hardly any other offer. That if it doesn't have a done-for-you component, where we'll just do everything for you. You don't even have to think. Um, we'll do your thinking for you. Uh, it, it can be dangerous because now you're treading in, there are some legal issues and stuff like that, so there's some things that you have to be careful about. And, and now you're creating, it used to be in my marketplace before it all became a done for you kind of thing, it used to be that when they didn't get the results that they wanted, you could point away from yourself. You could say, hey, don't come to me. What are you doing, you know? Now, of course, you can't do that when you start offering done-for-you services. So, but I, I still think that in this day and age that we're living in, if you guys can have those components as part of your, your mix of products and services that you, that you offer where you're doing things for your customers, where um, it's, it's sort of the sign of the times. Bill, is that, a, is that an under, I mean, in every market, have you kind of seen stuff like that in every market? Well, you heard it yesterday, right? Because your big ticket item is, I'll do it all for you, yeah. right? Yep. And it's just, it's such a much more easy sale for people to buy than, than having to do any work themselves. And, and, and I don't think it's so much that people are necessarily lazy, although some people are. I'm not saying it's just, it's just people are afraid. It's fear. Remember, greed and fear, those are the only two emotions, those are, if those are the only two emotions you ever think about when it comes to selling to your customers, unless your customer base is completely different than mine, um, greed and fear. And they're, they are afraid. Um, that's why they want, they want to just give your money to Dagan. Give your money to Russell. They'll take good care of you. They'll, you, you know, they'll, you're in good hands with those guys. No, no, it, it's, it's all after they give us, after they give us the $9, then, then we just follow up like crazy and... Uh, the original sale of the, the, the premium price product. No, it's, it's after they, they give us 9 bucks, we start following up for like a $3,000 offer right. then. And the, all those follow-up sequences, are, are they all just to get that original sale? Yeah, to get, well, to get the, the 3000 bucks. Right. There should be, it's in the sense of this, in the sense of this, we have our, our house list, our house list that built the house, you know, and, and for those people, we're slamming them like, like every week with a new offer. So, okay, so you have more than two offers, those are two or just the client Oh yeah, oh those are just, it's, those are new customer acquisition, because to our own customers, we can sell them anything. Right. I mean, we can sell offers that would never sell to people beyond, beyond our customer base, and so we just keep repitching to our customers again and again, always looking for its newness without its, the newness. It, it allows you to, um, well, one of my friends said one time, he said to me, uh, he goes, how in the world do you guys keep coming up with, uh, with new stuff? And I said, we just keep rewriting the same sales letter over and over again. You know, you just, it just uh, but the customers, they don't really know that. They, they, to them, they, their, their emotions make it impossible for them to realize that, that they're just getting the same thing. <laughs> they sound so devious, I know. I know it does. It sounds devious. Uh, if, if, if I, I, I'm in a room full of my peers, I hope. I hope you're not, like, judging me here. Uh, uh, I mean... Are they? 
Well, well, like with our fulfillment, we've got it streamlined now to where it's all just template. It's, so it's basically a template for us. So it makes it real easy for us to, to all of our programs have enough commonalities that, uh, that it's real simple just to plug something new in. And it's the same with you. It's the same with what you're, you're doing it to. It's just that there's, a, there's enough commonalities within it that make it real easy for you just to keep... Yeah, you're, you're every two weeks, right? You saw me yesterday, every two weeks. Uh, yeah, we do. We launch a new product every single month. Right. We used, to, we used to promote every month. Now we're promoting every week. We're trying to do something new. Massive launch every month, yeah. But it's really not new. It's just a new ad pool that we've got. It's a date. It's something important. That's one of our biggest things is just uh, something is happening on Tuesday, July 16th that can be worth a lot of money to you. you. You can't miss it. And in this case, Tuesday, July 16th, with a nice twist to it, is that during the event, you'll actually make money during the event, uh, potentially.